This meeting is being recorded. All right, we are live. Hi, everyone. I'm Lucy Jane Mukherjee. I'm the Programming Director at Tasvir South Asian Film Festival, and I'm also the co-founder of the Programmers of Color Collective, which is a professional development community for BIPOC film curators around the world. I'm really thrilled to have four of our members with us today. Um, you should be able to see their bios. Um, there'll be a link to the website where you can read those. Um, so we're gonna get started with uh, something a little bit different. We're going to uh, share how we identify outside of our work because it's not always about work. Um, so uh, my name's Lucy. I am a queer activist, an Aquarius, an older sister, an immigrant. Um, and I will pass to Ritesh. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful being here. I'm Ritesh Mehta. Um, I am really sad that Serena Williams and Roger Federer have retired from professional tennis, but I got to see I got to see uh, some of them at, at the U.S. Open earlier this year. And I'm a huge, huge Lord of the Rings fan. We can have we can have trivia battles. Who do you want to pass to, Ritesh? Oh, okay. Um, I'll pass it to Saroj. Hello, everyone. Namaste. Uh, I'm Saroj. I'm from Nepal. And besides films, I would say I'm a hiker. I like uh, traveling in the mountains. I love mountains. You know, I could be there for like days, but all these works and everything just bring me back to the city. But yeah, I love the mountains. I will call myself a mountain person. I'll pass it to Aisha. Thank you so much. My name is Aisha. Um, I would identify, I know you say it's not all about work, Lucy, but I would identify as a cinephile. I am certainly also a dog mama. Um, I am also a huge book nerd. So those are different things that de define me. And I'll pass it over to Ashna. Hi everyone, um, thank you for having me. Um, so outside of film, um, I love Halloween. Um, I uh, am a bit of a bubble tea connoisseur. I don't know if connoisseur is a strong word, but I love bubble tea. Um, and uh, I am a huge fan of early 2000s uh, emo music. Um, and uh, I'm actually seeing Paramore tonight. So um, reliving some childhood dreams today. Um, yeah, those are some few strong things about me. I love this. Thank you so much for humoring me. I learned something about each of you. <laughs> also a Paramore fan over here. Um, so we will be making time for questions from folks who are watching at home. Um, but I'll kick off with some questions first. So um, as curators, obviously, we all work for multiple festivals and organizations. We're juggling multiple gigs. Um, it's just the nature of the job. But something I think we all have in common is sort of our, our earnestness in um, just being film lovers. Um, and I think that I'd like for this conversation to really just humanize festival programmers for filmmakers who um see us as sort of a mysterious intimidating presence um <laughs> and I think it's a lot of the time for me it's less about um it's not about gatekeeping which is often what we're described as gatekeepers but it's about um opening the gate for filmmakers to um have the opportunity to share their work with an audience so on that note, I'd love to hear about a program or an event that you're particularly proud of being involved with and why. It doesn't have to be recent. It can be, you know, age old, but something that you you um, kind of got that buzz, that feeling that made you really proud to, to be doing this work. Who wants to go first? 
can start. I can go first. I don't mind doing oh. it. Oh, Ash, did I cut you off? I think you were. <laughs> That's, <about> to... <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, uh, actually the festival that I work at right now, I'm quite proud of, um, the Regent Park Film Festival based in Toronto. Um, it's a festival that has been a launching point for a lot of local filmmakers. And, um, this is my third festival working at this festival. Um, and so the stories I've heard over the years with filmmakers who've been involved and the thing, you know, they've been so, um, you know, they're, they're always so generous uh, with their time now after being a part of the festival because they're, they're like so happy to like be a part of this community and like, um, and what the festival did for their career starting off. Um, so yeah, I think that it makes me really happy to see that we're able to uh, provide that space for filmmakers. And, um, you know, often it's like the first time that a filmmaker is getting paid to show their work at a festival. Um, a lot of them are surprised that we pay them too. And like, so yeah, I'm just like happy to be a part of that kind of, um, yeah, that, that system of helping them set up their careers a little bit. Yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Um, Aishna, over to you. Um, well, I will second that, Ashna, I love the festival that you work at. <laughs> um, uh, I think the festival that has meant a lot and that I was really proud to be involved with is the Syria Film Festival in Toronto. And it started in the middle of the uprising in 2014. Um, and it was a festival that um, we didn't have one in uh, Canada that really focused on Syrian films at a time where people didn't know much about Syria except the war. So uh, when the festival started in the first year, um, we had a three day festival where every screening was sold out and the audiences were quite mixed. Um, you know, Arab speakers and also non-Arabs who wanted to learn more because Canada had started to welcome uh, people from Syria uh, as newcomers. So that's a festival that I feel really proud to have been the head of programming for, for several years in a row um, and really helped to establish it. Um, and now it's sort of, you know, it, had, it took a two year hiatus during the pandemic and is back this year. And yeah, so it's a festival that I love seeing and seeing where it's going because there's, there's still a need to really discuss on what is happening in the Middle East and in particular in Syria. I can go next. Um, when the pandemic hit, I work with the Indian Film Festival of Los Angeles, IFLA, and um, we were just two weeks out from our our festival so we kind of had to kind of really shut our doors very quickly and then you know the whole the whole world actually i felt was hunkered down end of march early april um of 2020 and we kind of kind of towards the end of april we had to figure out what to do uh and at that time a lot of festivals were just scrambling uh, i think there wasn't any uh, kind of set path and what we decided was to have like a virtual alumnus showcase because we realized that um, a lot of our alumni, and this came from our executive director, Christina Maruda, the idea that a lot of our alumni, we you know, we was we started in 2002 and um, a lot of them have films that aren't available on Vimeo or on maybe some more recent ones on Netflix and people are sitting there at home uh, all over the world. And we just kind of, assemble them all together. We had 125 alumni shorts and features available to everyone for 17 days. So we kind of called it IFLA over the years, 17, day, uh, 17 days of for 17 years of, of uh, alumni filmmakers. And the response was amazing because I think still for the first three months of that, of the of the pandemic in April, May, and June, uh, people were just eager for content. You know, everyone was actually scared for the survival as well. So it felt, um, it felt, people felt very, um, just very grateful to be kind of seeing each other's work. Or, or, you know, they've admired each other's work for a long time, and many of our audiences uh, also appreciated the kind of this vast history that we've kind of um, brought together. And I started in the festival only in 2016, so for me, kind of curating it and reaching out to our alumni. We reached out to 500 people of which 125 responded within a week. We kind of put everything together in three weeks, uh, including the website. And I learned a lot about the history of, of IFLA and I was an associate programmer back then. And since then I've moved up. So for me, it was like a really 
wonderful way to just learn about uh, the rich history we have because you know 20 years in a way may not sound like too much but so many filmmakers have, have begun their careers and you know have shown their works and just to have them back in the fold at a time when everyone's so scared and uh just genuinely uncertain um was was lovely and i think it was a different uh tack so i, I really enjoyed doing, putting that together beautiful thank you for sharing that so yeah, now, now you asked it and after everyone shared i realized uh i'm really proud of what i'm doing right now with nepal human rights international film festival uh, i remember i joined the uh, uh, human rights film festival in 2016 and it was very small lots of people didn't know about that and uh many filmmakers they they, they wouldn't even know that they could make a very good film on human rights issue earlier they were just thinking about making something about the ngo project or something like that would be um a human rights films that kind of thing and slowly uh uh at the same time the film schools in nepal they also started coming up and the uh, and uh, the uh, the film students the filmmakers they started making films just for the festivals so it, now it, it's getting really popular and since aisha mentioned i remember that year i I screened um, a Syrian love story. That was a beautiful, yeah, that was a very beautiful film. I think she just, uh, the character just passed away last year or something like that. And then um, then uh, earlier we, we had almost no submission. We had to get movies from like so many places. And last year, even when uh, it was during the pandemic, we had like 2000 plus submissions, you know? So now it has got really huge and, uh, since I've been doing it for so long, sometimes I get like kind of bored with it. Like, you know, you get, you, you've been doing it for so long, but now since you asked it, yeah, I'm proud of it. I, I love it. And I'll probably doing it for some more years. That's great to hear. Thank you. Um, it occurred to me that some of the filmmakers tuning into this might never have considered the experiences of us on the curator side of their submissions. Um, so I thought we could uh, dig into uh, a little bit more about the challenges of what we do. Um, I've definitely found a, a, a vast difference in the experience of programming at community-based nonprofits versus for-profit corporate organizations. Um, and right now, of course, I'm midway through the Tazria South Asian Film Festival. I, I just mentioned to you all that I had a roller coaster every weekend from stage fright on one day to the <laughs> the really electrifying Q and A experience that I had yesterday. Um, so, if you're comfortable sharing, what are some of the hard parts of the work that you do? And feel free uh, to jump in. Whoever wants to go first. Again. Um, I think, uh, well, most of my experiences have been in uh, smaller festivals, nonprofit and community based festivals. Um, so I don't really have the experience of working in like a super large team and, you know, um, uh, but I have really loved my experiences. And I think um, the challenges, sorry, this was about challenges, right? You said? <laughs> yeah, you asked about challenges. Um, Challenges, I think, obviously, when you're working in a smaller team, like you're definitely like spread thin and you at the same time feel like you you kind of, I don't know, maybe it is just like a thing that's in the minds of individuals as well who feel pressure of like putting on a big show. But like to compare, like in Toronto, it's like comparing ourselves to TIFF or something like that. And it's like, we, we're not at that level. We don't have that capacity, the, the capacity that they do or, um, you know, and I, um, I think it's like remembering like what your goals and mandate is and and like doing like doing well with what you have and um and I think uh like a part of I think for me like I love the part of programming where it's like obviously with the watching the films and like curating the programs and like writing description like all of that kind of stuff, like the fun creative stuff I really love but then there's this whole other side that people don't realize is like the admin side of the work um and where I spend like most of my day like 
responding to emails and like sending emails and being like, just following up on my last email. And like, you know, it's, it's like so much admin work. Um, and I, yeah. And I think that's so challenging when you, um, for me, like I'm, I'm pretty emerging in my career, I would say, like I've, you know, been working in festivals only for like the past five years or so. Um, and I'm, you know, lucky to have, um, become a programmer now but yeah I think like for me still kind of managing expectations of like what this role actually entails and like it is a lot of admin work and um yeah unfortunately you can't spend all of your time doing the fun stuff and then yeah and then just like work in like team it's such a team heavy job like working um like I can imagine the challenges working in a larger team having to communicate with like 10 million people but working in a smaller team even like having to check in with one another so much and and all of that and like um I think um I think when you see a lot of festivals it seems like the programmers are really like at the top of the kind of like pyramid maybe like like they're the ones making all the major decisions but it's like really such a big team of people who are behind all that work and um if you know if there's any if anyone takes anything out of this it's like the programmers aren't the only ones doing the work and there's so much work that goes on that people don't realize um anyways yeah so it's like that that teamwork um can be challenging at times but also like really great when everyone's on the same page and um you're working towards a goal and then when it when you see the festival come to fruition it's like so rewarding yes to all of that it's so true thank you um, I can go next. I've also mainly worked um, uh, in like smaller festivals. And I think, again, IFLA is a productive example for me because that's the one festival that I've been on most consistently. And, you know, programming is just like, programmers come on earlier, uh, very early on in the process. You know, um, once the program is set, typically for many festivals, then many other positions are hired. So we are working um, at least at IFLA for like, seven or eight months of the year and um you know once we lock the program the hardest part for me after all these months of having such sustained deliberations i love our team we're so also passionate um so a lot of it runs on you know emotional labor and you know um labor of passion uh but to write uh, what we call decline letters. We don't, we're trying, I'm trying to move away at team from the word rejection because I feel like there's a certain unnecessary and un, you know, unneeded violence in the term of like, like, we're not rejecting films. That's a very harsh way to kind of, you know, we don't really have the power or the disposition to reject something. So it's a decline letters. We, we, we write decline letters individually um, to all the films whose filmmakers we have relationships with um, or films that have made it fairly far into our discussion but did not make the final lineup. Those are very painful to write because, um, you know, with programming, I don't think, um, I don't know if filmmakers who are not, you know, many filmmakers, some filmmakers are programmers or they are friends with programmers, but many filmmakers don't know. Um, there's wild disagreements in programming teams. And, you know, oftentimes we're declining each other's, um, each other's uh, favorites, you know, through this extended deliberation process to, to write the decline letter where, I've spent for many of them like half an hour to 45 minutes, if not one hour sometimes for certain films that it's painful to say, not this year, we'd love to maintain a relationship with you. And then sometimes to receive um, feedback from filmmakers that it's kind of quite harsh. After we spend so much time writing those letters, uh, that hurts quite a bit. So uh, we know that we are constantly making many people feel less than good by, you know, we, we only take in about six or 7% of the films that we, uh, compared to our submissions and solicitations, but that's a really hard part. And amongst those friends, um, people who I know, people who've, you know, as I've, as I've worked more in the industry, I've gotten to know more folks whose films I've seen. It's not simply, I don't know the filmmaker whose films I'm seeing, that becomes harder too. So that's something to keep in mind is that, I know at least speaking from my team, those of us who write those personal letters, um, they're at the end of this long process where we're about to kind of announce a press release in two weeks, like everything's happening in two weeks, a rush to announce. At the same time, we're also writing these letters before the filmmakers know that the films didn't make it. Um, it's very, it's a very difficult and draining part of the job. 
Yeah, to pick up um, what Ritesh said, um, I do think that that's one of the parts that I find very difficult. Um, I've worked for some of the bigger festivals. I work for Hot Dogs in Toronto, and I also have worked for TIFF. And I do Canadian films at both festivals. And um, I think one of the hardest parts and that I find very challenging is turning down uh, films by friends. I'm part of the filmmaking community here as well as a documentary filmmaker. Um, and I then have to sometimes have really difficult conversations with friends or if they don't want to talk about it once in a while, I feel like they'll take stabs in public <laughs> and why their films were turned down. And I think that's tough. And um, so that sometimes makes it a, a bit difficult to write those, you know, as you say, decline letters. Um, I also find what's really challenging is the toll it takes on you after years of programming. Um, programming for documentary festival, we get human rights, you know, subjects, we get really tough films and you have a quota of films you're supposed to watch. So when you watch something really, you know, heavy and hard and for the Syria festival, it was like 90% heavy and hard. Um, you then have to move on and watch another film. And, um, and I think that I find myself getting um, increasingly sensitive. Um, sometimes you see gratuitous things and I think that's really tough as well. So um, I think that sometimes people don't realize how hard it is to watch a set number of films in one day, especially if half of them deal with very heavy subject matter. So I think that's become um, challenging for me and increasingly so. I thought I'd get desensitized instead I feel like I'm getting very sensitized as time goes on. Uh, I totally agree with what Ritesh and Aisha are saying. And uh, I used to write those later also, but uh, as, uh, as Aisha mentioned, it kind of takes a mental toll on you after a while. You know? So I stopped doing that a uh, couple of years ago. So it's all professional business-like letters that go out. And still we do get uh, those kind of uh, letters when we were after the rejection and most of the time we tend not to react to it because uh, it's not taking it anywhere. anywhere. And then uh, since uh, our filmmaking is such a small community here in Nepal and like even around South Asia, you sometimes get mails and uh, from people you know, acquaintances, uh, like how come my film was not selected? So I just kind of try to laugh it off. Uh, Maybe they were like some other, you know, it was on the same issue. So yeah, those kind of things do take a toll on you. And then uh, sometimes you, you you seek out films from filmmakers. That would be good because their previous work was really awesome. And then it just is not up to the par, you know, the, the, the second one you look for. And, uh, and that, that kind of awkward moment sometimes. It's easier with the first time filmmakers, but with the repeat filmmakers. So yeah, but so. Pretty much we all have the same experience regarding that. I think um, another thing I, I realized with programming is uh, like ISAM and how it takes, uh, it also have a direct uh, impact on you as a filmmaker, because uh, first of all, you get exposed to so much ideas, like you want to do something and you already see that it's been done somewhere, 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 and then you just like, okay, it's been done. Maybe I should not explore that. I, I've been realizing that lately. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't know about others' experience. That's what I thought. That's a really good point, Saroj. I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't, we have a couple of filmmakers on our team who are pro, on, on our programming team, but I actually hadn't thought about how seeing other stories that you want to tell being told already, that that has some sort of, I don't know. It seems like you're saying that it kind of uh, puts you off or makes you it, less it does it does like you you kind of like as a filmmaker you want your first story to be like a fresh like you know, with a perspective and sometimes it just uh, it's the, just the way you wanted to tell it so what what's the point of repeating it you know so it, it just take a back seat and then it takes a back seat it takes a back seat and that that just sits there you know well, that's that's actually interesting so because i think for me watching so many films and seeing other people's approaches to stories that I might be interested in telling is kind of inspiring. Like, it's nice to know someone has made that film. And then I think about a new approach of what could be my approach that's different. Because, you know, you do see like a million films about one subject, but most people approach it in very different ways. So for me, that's not necessarily a challenge. I think it's like a plus of the job. And being a filmmaker on top of that, it really helps me. Um, I was going to say along the lines of, back to the 
sending the declines. Um, I think that's another challenging thing is that people don't realize the conversations that go on behind the scenes. And sometimes it isn't just up to like, whether we like your film or not, it's kind of like sometimes we're fulfilling certain obligations of like what we've promised, uh, like that will happen with our programming, whether it's like for grants or for like certain partnerships or like whatever it is. And like, sometimes it really isn't that your film is good or sometimes that there's like a, an idea for a certain theme, but like this specific short film doesn't fit into the shorts package, but we really love it, but there's literally nowhere else to put it. And then we have to reject it. So it's like, stuff like that also happens and so like yeah I, I also feel like I wish I could reach out to each and every like filmmaker to be like this is why we rejected you not because we didn't love your film um so yeah it is like I totally agree with like the the rejection declining part is like super tough especially when you get to know more filmmakers yeah, yeah. and then sometimes it's like the challenge of explaining why certain choices were made because as you said we're part of a bigger team and you're not always making all the decisions so sometimes I have to speak to, why would you program this film? And you're like, yeah, I know it sucks, but <laughs> and you can't say that. So, you know, because you are a part of the festival and you're representing every film. So I think that's a challenge as well, where like people don't realize there is decision sometimes made above you if you work for a bigger festival. And then you're assigned to write the note and your name goes under it and everyone thinks you've selected it. <laughs> so I've had challenges where I really had to be like, how do I talk around this? <laughs> so yeah, that can also be like, instead of the declining, it's the accepting that you have to explain. That's so true. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I've, I've had to say no to superiors in the past who've asked me to write the program notes for a film that I didn't endorse. And I've just said, somebody else is gonna have to do that. Um, I think what's really been hard for me in recent years is seeing a decline in the LGBTQIA narrative features that are submitted to the festivals that I work for. And that's really pushing me to question, um, am I in the right place? Or should I be getting closer to the financing process so that I can help get more queer and trans stories made? Um, as, as programmers, we're watching a huge volume of content and we have to learn to trust our instincts, right? When we see something that inspires us and we want to present it to an audience, we know it has an audience. Um, but as some of you mentioned, we don't always have the final say. And that means having to advocate for the work that we believe in to our colleagues, to our superiors. Um, can some of you share an example of an experience that you had where you found a film that you loved and you brought it to your team, but it wasn't really as simple as that? You really had to fight for it to be selected. How did it go? Did it work out? Um, how, how did the, uh, the event unfold? I do have one. I mean, I don't have to like fight a huge battle. So I'm not going to pretend that I had to like really like go up against, you know, it, was, it wasn't the David and Goliath story, but there was a film that was submitted to us that I thought was really um, beautiful. It was done by a filmmaker who had spent all her time. I mean, I don't know if I should, I mean, can I mention the name? Okay, well, I will mention it. It's, um, it's a film by a Toronto filmmaker named Maison de Bonheur. And she had made a 16 mil film, um, by herself when she went to Paris for her 30th birthday. She stayed with this woman who was an astrologer and the film became sort of these 30 different snapshots of the woman she stayed with, who was you know, a senior citizen, had retired, but had been an astrologer, including to a few very famous people. And then my co-programmer and I, and when he watched it, he was like, ah, oh, no. And I thought, what? It had such a beautiful tradition of uh, women filmmakers that I was giving ode to, like I really, could sense like Agnes Varda and I could sense like some of the other um, uh, like Chantal Ackerman in her approach. And so to me, I was like, wow, this is such a beautiful ode to filmmaking on a sort of much smaller scale. And like, I thought our festival would be such a great, you know, Hot Dogs is a big platform. And I thought it'd be great to have this film at Hot Dogs, especially from a person who made it entirely on her own. Um, so we did have a bit of an argument about that film and in the end he was like, you know what, I give you that one if you give me this one. And he wanted a film that was about something I really didn't care about. Um, and we programmed both films and 
I mean, it is a success story for me to say that that film that went on to be incredibly successful and won a critic surprise. So um, that was a film that I felt was really, I was proud to go um, out to bat for because I really felt like it had such a beautiful, beautiful approach, such a beautiful touch. And I thought it really spoke a lot to women filmmakers of the past. So that's an example of a success story. Love that, thank you. Anyone else? Maybe the other side of, a co of the coin. Where yeah, for me, not... like Asna said, you know, like uh, fe uh, festivals like ours are largely dependent on the grants and the funding from the embassies, development agencies and everything. And uh, the, the main programming that we do, we don't have much problem with that, except for like maybe really political ones in the South Asia sometime they might, the, the embassies, they might get involved. That also happens very rarely. Usually they just uh, tend not to look at it, just let it go kind of thing, but sometimes it happens. But mostly it's about after all the programming is done, then you will be dumped with this like films, a set of films, okay? And then, and these are not bad films. These are not bad films per se. They have been to good uh, prestigious festivals and everything. But it just doesn't go with the theme you are playing with, you know, like, like every year you get it and then you want to be there, you want to make it like symphony, you know, you have like these films playing, you know, and then the the administrative part of it, they would want most of it in because they would want to, and you have to fight not to have them in there and you have to be very delicate and very um, diplomatic about it and uh, that's that's the harder part for me, especially. The election part is easier. It's the rejection part. This role calls for many skill sets. <laughs> Go ahead, Ashley. Um, yeah, I feel like I, I'm trying to think of like a time where I like really had to fight for something, but I honestly can't think of anything because I have mostly worked in small teams and um, to be honest, like when you're working in a smaller team and everyone's kind of spread thin, like outside of the programming team, everyone doesn't really have time to like give their like watch everything with you and give their input as well. Um, aside from like our programming advisories and things like that. And I have found that for the most part, like people have had very similar opinions, like nothing too drastic or dramatic has happened in these conversations. Um, but I guess there has been a few times with a few of the festivals I've worked with that like, you know, maybe there is like one or two films that are a bit weaker in terms of like production value, but their stories are really great. And it's like that conversation of like, you know, do we want to support this filmmaker because they're telling great stories and, you know, like hopefully this is like a great launching point for them and they'll make better films, they'll get better with the filmmaking part of it, but their stories are there and, you know, it fits with the other stories we're telling and, you know, so it's always those types of conversations and usually when I know there's like a few weaker ones in there, I always come with like my points ready. I'm like, this is why I'm defending this one. <laughs> like, these are all my points for why we should program it. Um, so yeah, and like, yeah, if for the most part, I feel like I've never really had to give up on any of the films I was really fighting for. So um, that's that's my in, in a smaller team. Who knows? Maybe one day I'll work in a bigger team and it might be different. But <laughs> we have a lot of drama on our small team sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, um, when I was an associate programmer in 2020 or 2019, um, I think it was the programming coordinator and the associate programmer that year. And um, there was a film, I can't mention the name, but it was, it had a high, high enough profile in India at the time, but it hadn't played to the international festivals and it was submitted to us. And, um, like a couple of the programmers kind of didn't like watched it, but they weren't sure. And they thought that I might be the person who might like it. And I watched it and, you know, what's, what's interesting about programming just as a side note is um in a small team you can get to know each other's tastes and minds really well and that's part of the joy where even if, as professional colleagues to be able to read alongside your colleagues minds um there's a kind of beautiful synchro um 
a synchronicity in there, but it's also very frustrating because you know that you think you know someone's taste until the exception comes, and there's so many of them. And I was surprised at my own response to the film because it's a little bit broad, but it has these beautiful dance sequences, and I thought it would appeal to a much larger audience. So it's not, you know, we can play these really kind of highbrow indie features, but this was much more, I could see my mother responding to that film really well and to all her friends responding. And, you know, we have similar kind of audience for some of our films at IFLA. So I just made a case for it repeatedly across four programming meetings. And in our final deliberations meeting, my director of programming was giving me the eye, like, we've talked about this film enough. I don't know why you're still talking about it. Um, so I, I, I tried I, to use different tactics. I wrote down my arguments. I tried to bring up different points, but I was the only one. And then they said, okay, let's see what our programming intern thinks of it. And even the intern did not like it. So I was the only one. So uh, I had to let it go. But um, I still think that having seen how other films we've played that are similar to that film have received been received so well, um, I feel like that film would have done well. But, you know, and that that's, again, like, I think a lot of uh, filmmakers who aren't programmers, which is most of them, uh, don't realize that these battles are fought, especially if you're in a smaller festival sometimes, just depending on uh, the programming ethos of the festival. Um, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of re uh, decline and rejection within the programming team itself. So keep that in mind as well. <laughs> totally. I, I'm realizing that I asked the question because I'm traumatized from <laughs> my first year at Tribeca when I pushed for a film. I was literally begging for my team to invite it. I remember even praying and I'm not religious. <laughs> um, but it's usually, in my experience, content that's centered on black and brown identities and it just gets labeled as too risky or there won't be an audience for that, which is obviously untrue. Um, and actually, Tazvir is my first experience of being able to program more than like two South Asian films in one lineup. Um, let's see. I think um, I'm I'm keen to hear about like how you all structure your work. How how do you get things done? What what does your programming process process look like? Um, what does your what does the structure of your team look like when it works the best? Um, and I think usually this means you have time, right? You're not rushed. That's like the ideal process, but. Do any of you um, want to jump in and, and describe sort of your, your ideal workflow? I mean, I'm sure I'll start. <laughs> An ideal workflow. I think you're right that having time is like very of the essence. Um, I really love it when I get jobs in a period or programming jobs in particular in a period where I don't have um, other gigs lined up because as programmers what people also don't realize is that we're severely underpaid so as a severely underpaid programmer I take on many gigs so when I have a period where I don't take on many gigs and I have one that I kind of enjoy I love that I have this sort of time to treat it like a job where I literally go to a studio that I rent um, from like 10 to 5 or 6 p.m and I watch films and I write about them and like I take a break when it's like you know when I usually want to, like, it feels humane, it feels like a job, I enjoy it. Um, that's like my best setup. And when it comes to the kinds of teams I love working with, at Hot Dogs, I work with a team I deeply love. Um, we're split into international and Canadian. And on the Canadian team, we are three, two of us who watch a much larger number, and then we have an associate programmer. And the three of us get together every few weeks and we talk about the films we've seen and we discuss them. We talk about every Canadian film submitted. Um, so it each gets a view. Uh, the international team has to sort of like read through because they just get thousands of submissions. And I think to me, that's sort of like um, a setup I love. The other two, I really respect their tastes and then their views on history, their own film, their own sort of experiences that they bring to it. So we're a really nice team of three people where we get to discuss, we get to disagree, we deep dive. Sometimes we spend too long on a film. So um, that to me is also like such a beautiful setup and it's the reason that I've stuck around for so many years on that team. 
That's really illuminating. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Yeah, I would agree. Like, if I had so much time to watch things and like, uh, unfortunately, it's like sometimes you're watching films when you're like really tired or like not in the mood to be watching a million things. And like, to me in my mind, I'm like, oh, no, I'm like not equally like I don't have the same energy equally like for every film I'm watching. Um, and so I feel bad. But like, obviously, we try our best to like give each one the attention it deserves and like watch it thoroughly, make notes thoroughly about it. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll speak to like the process at Region Park Film Festival specifically. Um, when I was first with the festival in 2019 as the program coordinator, um, it was my first time kind of taking on such a large amount of submissions. And um, at that point, so we had a team of um, a program advisories or like pre-screeners, some festivals call it. Um, so we would dump like all the submissions on them. So like hundreds of submissions, like they would weed through them and then we would try to have meetings to talk about them. Uh, but like people barely showed up for those meetings and like for like fair for the amount of like how much we were asking them to watch. Like, I don't think we were, um, you know, able to pay them as much as like we wish we would have, like we could have for that, for that type of work. Um, and so when I took over in the programmer role last year, I decided to kind of flip it and have the programming team do the load of the work, which was sifting through all the submissions and then giving the advisory like a long list of films. Um, and I think that has worked for these past two years, like so much better for us where we're able to have like productive conversations and also like the hiring process of the, the advisory is really important as well. Um, we're a programming team of two people. Um, it's me and the program coordinator. So obviously we are two people with very limited experiences and lived experiences and, and you know, biases to, to what we enjoy and, you know, the stories we are vouching for. So we try to hire a, a team of at least four people from different backgrounds and like who come with different experiences who can watch the films. Um, and so, yeah, and that's such a lovely process as well to like have people who care about the stories you're trying to tell and like who are there to like help you tell or like put together a really good festival with a range of stories. Um, so yeah, I found that process has worked really well. And then once we get the feedback from the advisory, um, then uh, our team internally then is like, okay, well, here are some themes that emerged. Uh, let's, and something I actually picked up from when I was working at Hot Docs was like a whiteboard of sticky notes um, to, to help put together the program. <laughs> um, and I, I worked in the, the youth and education program, um, Docs for Schools when I was at Hot Docs. And so I used to sit around the programmers and I used to watch their process um, during festival season. Um, so yeah, that was one thing I picked up from them was like, using a whiteboard and like moving things around. I, and I, it's super helpful. Um, so yeah, like I love the process of like putting things together. And um, I think this whole process, like for me, the whole process like involves a lot of intentional conversations and like thinking about how audience might receive the stories, um, like what we want to stand for. Again, going back to like our mandate and vision, like at, um, at Regent Park Film Festival, we, um, are located in Canada's largest uh, public housing neighborhood. And so we support um, people with low income backgrounds. Um, BIPOC artists are our main focus, but low income background, um, emerging filmmakers. Um, so yeah, like we're, we're very intentional about the stories we tell. Um, and yeah, so that's that's kind of the process. And then once, you know, internally uh, with the programming team, once we have some ideas of themes and uh, shorts programs and features we want, then we kind of share it with the larger team and see if there's any feedback. Um, but yeah, it's um, still, even with the advisory, it's quite a small team altogether. But yeah, that's kind of the process. That's really great. Thank you for sharing the thoughtfulness of the process. and inviting in other lived experiences is so important. One quick thing I'll say is um, we, uh, at IFLA, we also just, we spend a ton of time, you know, our, and, but the last one, especially because like Omicron really hit um, in January. So we were so happy to be just in virtual Zooms across three or four time zones, um, programmers of five, a group of five people. We talk about the films that we all love as well. You know, so oftentimes I've heard like some other programmers on our team say that other festivals we worked at, if everyone loves something, okay, it's all checked, 
it's in, you know, we don't discuss it, but I think what we really enjoy doing, I think it's like our moment of giving the film its time uh, because oftentimes there's no guarantee that, uh, you know, if the filmmaker can't, can't make it to the festival for whatever reason, then, you know, the I feel like it's my job or, and we try to impart this to the team and I have a wonderful, wonderful um, fellow co-director of programming, Tuli Dosio. So both of us, we kind of set that ethos where we want to discuss films we love and we want to know, get to know each other better, get to know the, pro you know, like we are spending so much time together over three months and everyone's, some folks are in New York. Um, we have a programmer in India as well. So it's, um, we try to just honor the film by talking about why we love it, not simply, you know, like the deliberations around the mixed voting and um, that, that sense of collegiality that comes across um, helps foster and kind of buffer during the discussions where we have that get a little bit more involved and heated. Um, but yeah, I think that's what I really enjoy about it. Just kind of um, also bringing in, um, I started off as a screener at IFLA, I was in the living room so screeners were who were in Los Angeles. Uh, we we could sit in and, and discuss alongside the programmers, and you know the, with the um, with the uh, pandemic that has happened less. So we want to make sure um, we, we we began paying our lead screeners. Um, we kind of kind of also similar to what Ashna was saying. We found funding because, you know, like screening in so many festivals is voluntary work, which kind of drives me crazy. I was like an unpaid screener for so many years. And I did that partly because I needed credits for my visa and my green card. Um, but we restructured it so that we had lead screeners take on, say, 100 shorts or, you know, 40 features. And um, then we would bring them in also in the meetings and make sure that we kind of went through all their coverage in between the meetings so that we use that time the most efficiently at the meeting. So is this a, uh, if it's a small group um, and you're spending so much time um, and doing, a, you know, as, as Aisha was saying, it's not very well paid work. So you try to gain fulfillment for our other life dimensions through, through that process. Yes, yes, you just reminded me when I was working for the LA Film Festival, Roya Rastagar was the director of programming and she really wanted to go for the films that would divide the room, that would have the programmers on their feet <laughs> in disagreement. People who loved it and people who hated it, those were the titles that, that were invited. And the films that we were all like, ah, oh, it's all right. They didn't get it, <laughs> as they shouldn't. Uh, Saraj, anything to share? Yeah, pretty much I agree with what Ritesh and said, like, we use the same thing. We we do screeners. We also pay a little bit of money. We don't have a lot of money to pay, but I'm totally against making people work for free and everything. And then uh, I, I personally, I try to go through most of the film myself, but we have like such a heavy submission from especially Iran and India. It's just, I'm like almost... 40% of the submissions are from these two countries. So we need to take that, but otherwise like, uh, because we, 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 we try to make uh, the, the festival more inclusive as a, as a country also, like we used to sometimes, like we don't get much films from Africa. So once we get from there, we have like special, like people looking into it, you know, if it, uh, if it has like up to the mark and everything, we kind of, try to make concession for them. So it's a different bit of uh, uh, way we do the screen, uh, um, the programming is involved, but yeah, mostly what Ritesh said, I don't know, uh, we, and uh, we have to be very sensitive sometimes and those kind of uh, films, I tend to take it to the board myself, you know, because uh, I don't want like unnecessary controversy sometimes, you know, like, even this year, we have some films uh, very religious oriented, you know, like uh, very political sensitive and everything. I tend not to make such decisions only on myself, you know, <laughs> if it makes any sense, you know. So, so I, I tend to take it to the like to everyone, you know. What's we do? So most of the time, we we saw them. <laughs> very well. Yeah, that's interesting. I 
think like we actually take films sometimes to other festivals. Like we've had a film, we weren't sure if we should program it because it was about yeah. the Falun Gong. And we took it to the yeah, human yeah. rights same, festival. Same thing, yeah. same thing with right, right now. I have, I have the same film this, this year. And, uh, you know, like, uh, it doesn't have like very, very nice, uh, uh, and, and the film is amazing, you know, like the way it's made and it, it has that uh, flea, last year's flea in the Oscar, it has that kind of feel. But uh, the organizing itself, it's, I think it's blacklisted in the country also, something like that, you know, so. So. Yeah. so speaking about it's the Falun Gong film from Canada which yeah. is a film that we have to do our like due diligence we did end up showing it it won an audience award at our festival but we did have to circulate it to other festivals to really make sure that the decision we're making is one that we can stand by so we did show it to Human Rights Watch we showed it to several other and we asked um, um, how they would assess the film so sometimes we reach outside of our own festival um, because it is so specific and so particular exactly. and as you said entirely on your own team or on your own um and we've made lots of mistakes in the past to be honest so i think it comes out of that knowing that we have programmed things that have been problematic that um people who are affected by it had pushed back and actually um this has now led to a process where we're much more careful with films that we are unsure about that's a really good segue to my last question i think which is um I wanted to pick your brain about the ethics of this profession and um, what best practices look like to you in the programming process. You mentioned the Aisha bringing in other communities to vet the films that you're considering. Um, what are some of the elements that you're weighing aside from what's on the screen? Um, and I asked this question sort of in the light of um, the Sundance debacle the, earlier this year, at the top of this year, um, with the documentary that was criticized for putting its subjects at risk and not being made by the community that it was about. Um, I don't want to publicize the film title any longer, so I'm not going to get too deep into that. But yeah, what are you, um, what are you interrogating in a submission aside from the film itself? Uh, let me go first. Uh, personally, uh, uh, I look for the films that question the status quo, and like it should challenge the status quo itself, and then uh, it should help uh, move the society, not necessarily mobile, it should be forward looking, you know, like uh, lately, especially within Nepal, we have been very, very fam film that uh, very reactionary in narrative, in their narrative. So I, I tend to look for that. And uh, lately, uh, I've been very critical of these uh, parachute filmmakers. They just like jump in and then make film like within a week, like a feature length uh, documentary, and then go back. And uh, those kind of films, I've been very critical of them lately because uh, uh, it, it could be for the fact that we have filmmakers from the same region making that same film, you know? And um, I, I think it, it really matters who is making the film, especially lately. Uh, maybe it was not the case before, but now there are filmmakers from almost every community. Maybe they are not making on all the issues, but uh, if we look hard enough, we can find them. So those are the things that I keep in mind actively nowadays. Um, I think like, you know, uh, at Hot Docs, we've added a new question to our submission, which is the question of what is your relationship to the community that you made the film about? And I think that's become like a very important consideration. I often read the, not often, I almost always read the answer to that question in particular. And if someone doesn't answer it, I get even more suspicious um, because sometimes they'll be like N-A. And you think, well, actually, no, you do owe us an explanation here. Um, so I think that's something we think about. And so just as you said, this has become an increasingly uh, a worry for programmers, I think, across the board, thinking about parachute filmmakers who come in, take a story and leave and don't feel like there's a real engagement or exchange or give back or even um, allyship. I mean, those are things we're all thinking about and talking about, like who has the right to tell what story, uh, 
I'm consistently learning. Um, I think it's, you know, not, we don't all have the answers, you know, and have gotten it right always. I think another thing though, but then on the flip side, I find that there are films we're not getting about certain subjects and I'm like desperate to see films about a subject matter. And then sometimes if a filmmaker who's not from the community has made the film, I do also think for security reasons, it makes sense to me sometimes. So for example, I do know, um, um, we didn't program the film, but it was a film made by Uyghurs and it wasn't made by a Uyghur filmmaker. And I thought that was smart because I think anyone from the Uyghur community who takes on that subject of human rights and it was in relationship to a person living in Canada, um, they would have their family probably threatened. And then it made sense that the filmmaker said, I have no, um, I'm not Uyghur. I'm not from that background. I don't have, I made this out of really thinking that there's an urgency to the subject matter. And I think that was like the flip side where I was like, that is smart. You needed someone who's not from that community who then would be at risk. Um, so yeah, I also think those are the kinds of things we think about and talk about, you know, um, they're very uh, important questions we ask um, of the filmmakers these days. That's a great insight, thank you. Uh, Ashna, did you have anything to share? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have um, a similar kind of process with our submissions where we invite people to self-identify um, and also talk about who else is on their team who identifies with the communities that we prioritize. Um, and yeah, totally agree about like sometimes the films aren't made by BIPOC filmmakers, but if there is a, a specific reason for why they're choosing to tell this story, like I think it's uh, worth a watch sometimes and having a discussion about it. Um, and also, as I mentioned, like, you know, our, a part of our process is having very intentional conversations about why we're programming certain things. Um, and, you know, I think it does start with like, who is on the team, um, like obviously who's on the programming team, but then who's also on the rest of your team as well. Um, and we try our best to hire um, people who are from the communities that we're representing and, you know, people who, um, you know, really understand what our goals are with our storytelling. Um, and I think that helps as well. Like there has been times where there's been a film that I'm like, I don't know, is this a good representation of this community? And I've, I've asked, you know, another team member about it. And I've been like, I love your opinion about it. Like, you know, is this thing offensive to you? Like, do you, I don't know, like, have you heard other people talking about it? Um, and also social media too, like, Twitter is a great place for like discourse and like I love reading like I like reading reviews I like reading what people are saying about it on social media because at the end of the day I think um you know as much as we're programming like the really artsy stuff and the things that like other like filmmakers would appreciate and like other programmers might appreciate it's also for our audience um and I I um like to keep that kind of like everyday person who's watching in mind as well so if there's something that the uh, I know a general the general public will appreciate as well. That's something I'd really like to know. Um, so yeah, I, I like to research on all different ends, more some more informal and some a bit more formal. Yeah, the detective work is definitely part of the job. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like the amount of time, like we spend a lot of time like googling directors and like looking at their social medias and like figuring, you know figuring out what their life is and why they made this film. And like, you know, it is a lot of detective work. <laughs> Just to uh, piggyback on a couple of points that Ashna mentioned, I think a lot of it for me now is that I'm in the position to kind of hire our programmers. Um, Tuli and I kind of pay attention to the casting of the programming team and make sure that we're, sometimes it's almost a matter of like listing out everyone's training just so that we know people have different kinds of training even the fields that they're trained in and um you know so some some folks are trained in anthropology some in critical studies some in cinema studies just to know what people's you know, we, we often think with our training right that's because we've invested so many years of our lives being trained in a certain field so it's hard to kind of give that give that up so just to have a diverse versatility there uh, but sometimes there's always going to be films and that's great um about underrepresented topics, but may not be filmmakers from those backgrounds. Who filmmakers always always interrogate the privilege of the filmmakers vis-a-vis um, -vis the subjects with documentaries, but even with narrative and hybrid filmmaking as well. And um, if there isn't enough of that representation in our programming team, I would reach out to our executive director and ask her which of our alumni, since uh, you have a vast alumni database, is it 
So first we'd ask my executive director to watch it. And then if she feels, you know, maybe share the film with someone who, you know, the filmmaker, if they found out later on that this alumnus also shared it, it wouldn't be too much of a problem and get their feedback. Because if, if, if it's a film about cast and I'm, I'm, I would be like the privileged cast, right? So I wouldn't be able to evaluate everything. Um, so just to get to make, to kind of do that extra due diligence and effort is super important. Um, and where my training comes in, I would, I would, I would pitch in. So for, for example, I've been trained in communication and, uh, and within that, like, uh, what's called entertainment education. So we had a film that had a very, about, about, about a hot button topic. And I was at the time a senior programmer, um, and, you know, many folks on our team loved it, but something was making me very uncomfortable about it. I couldn't pin it down. One thing we do also to hedge this process is to discuss the film multiple times. That's why just a quick note to filmmakers, submit to us early so that we have more time to discuss and think about your films. Um, don't wait until the late deadline all the time. Uh, but we discuss those films over multiple times to see over a two month process, how the feeling has changed about it. But with this one film, um, I felt that I couldn't express myself in a in a room discourse, so I wrote down my argument. It was like a very long email, which was, you know, for Gen Z person, so they were like, "What kind of email is this?" Um, but I, I wrote down a philosophical analytic argument, and that made my own position very clear. And I shared it with the team, and um, I just I it, I just felt that um, the narrative wasn't was clashing with the important health information that's being dispensed in the film. And I think it was irresponsible to program the film. And I didn't know that that's what I was feeling until I actually wrote down the argument and shared it with the team. So sometimes it's not a matter of just talking, but also trying other modalities of, of discourse. So true, so true. And unfortunately, we don't always have that time if we're being rushed. I've had the experience of um, you know, we have maybe a, a last minute um, meeting with a sales agent later that day and we have to decide on the spot, are we accepting these films or not? Um, and that can be so difficult. I'm wondering if, um, by the way, we don't have any questions, but we do have viewers. They're listening intently, uh, but they haven't posted any questions in the chat. Um, so, I'm wondering if we could think about um, the filmmakers watching, what might we like to share with them that would demystify the programming process? We've covered a lot of ground already, but if there's anything else that we haven't touched on yet, this would be a good time to share. I think uh, that note that you just said, Ritesh, not waiting till the end. Of the... Yeah, just a couple of quick notes on that. I, I would think I would encourage filmmakers to think of festivals not as abstract entities, as as similar to what you know the points that Ash and as everyone has been making. We're a set of we're a temporary organization. Oftentimes, not, not all festivals are year round. We come together for a short period of time, but we're multiple groups with different roles and responsibilities. So think of us as flesh and blood individuals. I would say. Oh, I wouldn't, don't say, you know, Outfest accepted me, say, you know, this group at Outfest thought about my film, like think about the particular people there. And also I would say, do your research because, you know, um, it just, they don't send, you know, of course, if you've made a short, it's a huge achievement if it's your first short and you're very excited to send it out of the world because maybe your friend's film had played at a festival and you want to send it there, but like, you know, do your due diligence and look at the lineups and see what kind of films that, you know, maybe it's just not a good fit and that everyone, it would do everyone a lot of favor if you, just a little bit of research uh, into where, you, where, where you're sending. But again, just think about, like, don't say, you know, if Le accepted me, if Le declined me or rejected me. It's people who are doing their work to the best of their ability, trying to kind of, hedge our um you know inconsistencies the best we can but it's groups of people so think about think about that and that's also a great way to kind of form relationships with festivals because that's how we also we're in the business of you know um highlighting great stories and art or whatever you have it but it's also about relationships and it's good to think in terms in, in terms of concrete people whenever possible that's me 
Anything else to share? I was also going to say the research bit. Um, there's, you know, um, Regent Park Film Festival does not charge for submissions. And so that opens up like the world is your oyster and like submit whatever you want <laughs> type of the deal. Um, so, you know, like we in the past have used uh, Film Freeway, which is an international platform. And then we've also used a Google form, um, which we tend to get way more like local submissions from. Um, and this year um, we decided um, I pitched not to use Film Freeway because we were just getting so many submissions, um, which is like, it's really nice to get international submissions, but at the same time, it's a lot of people who don't understand like what our goals are, who don't care to look into what our festival is about. They just want to submit to submit, you know, um, and, you know, obviously everyone should shoot their shot, like do what you can. But at the same time, it's like our team is like sitting there watching like hundreds of submissions that don't apply to like anything that we are about. Um, and so, yeah, the research bit 100%. I would say if you are starting wanting to kind of start smaller and like, um, you know, um, attend events where you might meet programmers, like just talk to programmers. <laughs> and like, you know, I, like, I would say like networking, it feels like an icky word to me. I don't like that word, but like becoming friends with programmers or like, um, just like asking questions and like not during like busy times, like don't ask like months leading up to the festival, but like, earlier in the year when, you know, it's not like our busy time, um, attend events, like meet programmers and ask questions, like, what are you looking for? And, you know, whatever. Um, but it is very much about the individual festival. So it's like not every festival operates the same or, you know, might not be blanket advice all the time. So true. I was just reminded yeah. as you were speaking about um, when I was programming for Outfest, the mission of course is to um, celebrate work that centers queer identities and we'd get films where there was maybe one not even secondary character but like tiny little bit character that was queer and they would submit it anyway and it just wasn't a fit and sometimes there wasn't any queer characters <laughs> but they would still submit so read up on the places you're submitting to understand what they're looking for and please fill up those forms, you know, those forms are there for a reason. Please, please do fill up those forms. You now, like Aisha mentioned, don't say not, you know, not applicable or anything. And uh, as Ashna said, uh, usually the, the firms, they have their own themes, their own issues they tend to take away. So just don't submit it randomly. It's not gonna take you anywhere. And uh, another thing, uh, don't be afraid to write for a waiver and uh, uh, be proactive, be genuine, you know, like, and then, so most of, probably you be provided with a waiver fee and uh, the waiver fee uh, or the payment, both of those firms, they will be equally judged. So you don't have to worry about that. So do, do some research on your part, like us and mm -hmm. good luck. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I think I would add to that. Um, I think that one of the things I do find sometimes is um, people submit films before they're ready. So they'll say, oh, it's not sound mix, not color corrected. And, you know, there's been a few times where I've seen a long list of what hasn't been done yet. And I think, like, do put your best foot forward. So I think, like, um, if you can submit or you're afraid, because I do understand sometimes people have financial limitations. If you submit the film, we read notes that you write to us in like when there's extra note sections, or as I said, I always read the answer to the you know, uh, specific question. Put a note in that watch the film in a month, the link is in there now, but it'll be color corrected at the end of December. If it's within our viewing window, we will wait. Um, there is nothing as irritating as watching the same film three times. Um, so, um, yeah, communicate. I think that's one of the big things. I think people are very afraid. They think that there's just like nobody at the other end or people who aren't, who don't have time for you. But we do read your notes, we do understand. So I think it's important to remember that um, you can let us know what's happening with your film. Yes, 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 all of that, thank you. Um, I think to close, I'm wondering if each of you could describe the types of films or the genres that you wish you had seen more of in the submissions for your festivals. For me, it's definitely um, 
queer rom-coms or trans stories that go beyond the transition experience and just into people living their lives. Um, there's never enough of those. Anything come up for you? I would love to see more uh, horror thriller uh, BIPOC stories um, that aren't necessarily based around racism. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I feel like I don't see enough of those. Just more genre, just more, I feel like I don't see enough of genre among South Asian films as I'd like to see. Um, and uh, yeah, just definitely more queer films uh, and films that intersect across various identities, um, you know, like a queer, queer film about, about like a little person from a so-called lower caste experience, you know, all of those kind of those kind of identities where the filmmaking team has taken the pains to ensure that the perspective that comes out is, um, you know, is valid. And also um, I think I was from other parts of the diaspora not just the US or Canada. I think for me it's two ends. One end is um, I often think a documentary has such a threshold of getting in because you work for so long for free and it takes so long to make a film and you need technology. So I agree that I would love to see films from people um, whom, whom we don't see much cinema. For example, people who are living on the street or, you know, I'm always really curious in seeing their perspectives represented in cinema. Like that would be fantastic. And then on the other end, um, which is almost sounds like an opposite is, I see a lot of really big budget films being directed by white men. I'd love to see really big budget films directed by women. I'd love to see big budget films directed by BIPOC or people on various other forms of spectrums because um, that's something that was consistent for me when I worked at TIFF, where I literally was like, wow, if people knew the percentage, it would be staggering to see what the above a million dollar budgets, who that goes to. Yeah, uh, especially uh, films from South Asia, the kind of we get in our festival, I wish uh, more women would be making films about women themselves and lots of city guys making films about women living in the village. It's like too much, you know, they're like too much of them. So guys, please hold on that, you know, <laughs> might think of something else, so yeah. I mean, just generally more women feature filmmakers in South Asia, I feel like we tend, we have, with shorts, we're able to find so many wonderful non-men filmmakers. Actually, no, we don't have enough trans filmmakers. Oh my God, yeah. So please, I uh, would love to see that as well. But um, somehow we have so many alumni, uh, like women alumni who make shorts and somehow we just, our features, we're having trouble finding those. So I don't know, I, I would love to see funding and more opportunities given to, to women and non-men filmmakers. Uh, for features. For sure, for sure. Um, at Tazvir, we've been seeing a theme in the last few years of South Asian sci-fi stories, which is really exciting, um, like lo-fi sci-fi that don't require VFX, but still have an element of magic realism or time travel. And I think this is such an exciting trend. So I want to say to filmmakers, more of that, please. <laughs> I think that's all we have. Um, I'm so grateful for everything that was shared in this conversation. It's been super illuminating and um, really generous of you all to, to give up this time to, to talk to us about what you do. Thank you so much. And um, I expect that uh, filmmakers will be going and uh, taking note of what you asked for and uh, hopefully you'll be seeing films um, of that ilk in your inboxes soon. Thank you. And, Thank you for uh, having us. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. It's great to be here.